Yeah, I'm back. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, uh, we'll start, sir, in between. I'll uh, keep on trying. Yes, please. Uh, a, a very warm uh, good afternoon to one and all present here. It's my proud privilege on behalf of Department of Sociology and IGNO Regional Center, NOIDA, to welcome Professor Biswajit Das, sir, who is Director, Center for Culture, Media and Governance, Jam Jamia Milia Islamia, New Delhi. Before I ask, sir, uh, to proceed and ask Dr. Lopa Mudra to introduce uh, Professor Biswaji to all of us. I want to cite one thing. I am seeing, sir, after around 10 odd years, you know, we, had, we were doing a two days national workshop sponsored by University Grants Commission uh, on media exploitation of women somewhere around uh, 10 years down the line. Live on that day. So, after 10 years now, it's our pleasure that we will have with us Professor Viswaji Das, sir. Now, I request Dr. Lupamudra uh, to please pre present a brief profile of Professor Viswaji Das, sir. A warm good evening to one and all attending this session today. I'm Dr. Lupamudra Bhattacharji, former assistant professor of Amity School of Communication, Amity University, Jaipur. I'm presently reaching out to you all from Dhaka, Bangladesh. At the very outset, I would like to thank Dr. Sanjeev Mahajan, sir, head of the Department Sociology, NAS College, and the convener of the seven-day long national workshop on research methodology for giving me this opportunity to present as a reporter of today's session. We are privileged to have with us today one of the stalwart of media educators in India, Professor Biswajit Das. Dr. Das is professor and founding director of Center for Culture, Media, and Governance. He has over three decades of teaching and research experience in the field of theory, method, and history of communication in India. Prior joining the center, he worked with national and international agencies in, in conducting communication research and training. Professor Das, of Sociology of Communication in Department of Sociology, Jamia Milia Islamia, offering courses on media and society, culture, media and society, and media education. Sir taught communication theory and development communication in AJK MCRC, Jamia Melia, Mudra Institute of Communication, Ahmedabad, and other central universities. Sir has been in the advisory board of several universities and colleges in devising course curriculum in sociology, media, and communication studies. Professor Das has been a visiting professor at York University and fellow at the University of Windsor, Canada, fellow at MSH Paris, INALCO Paris, Charles Wallace Trust London, and the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, India. He has been a member of Innovation Council of Information and Broadcasting Ministry, Government of India, and member of Joint Committee constituted by University Grant Commission, MHRD, and Information and Broadcasting Ministry, 
to monitor media related courses in India. Besides, Sir has been in the advisory board of Consortium of Education Commu Communication, New Delhi, and National Council Rural Institute, and several other distinguished bodies such as UGC, ICSSR, and the Councils of Government of India. His research has been supported by the Indo-French Scholarship, Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, Charles Wellis India Trust, Ford Foundation, SSRC, UNESCO, UNDP, IDRC, UGC, and ICSSR, and Hybos, Netherlands. He is the co-editor of SAGE series on communication processes, of which the first volume on media and mediation in the year 2005, the second one on the social and the symbolic in the year 2007, and the third one on communication, culture, and confrontation in the year 2010. Professor Das is published in various national and international journals. Currently, Professor Das is a member of Open Education Resource, MHRD, Coordinator Center for Potential with Excellence in Media and Communication Studies in India, Coordinator Special Assistance Program, UGC MHRD, and heading as principal investigator of EPG Partshala program. In media and communication studies, UGC MHRD, Sir coordinated nine papers comprising 360 modules and videos available in the repository of InfliBNet. Currently, Professor Das is the founding president of All India Communication and Media Association in India and received Best Media Educator Award in the year 2018 by Exchange Literature for Learning. Media. I heartily welcome you, sir, in today's session of the seven-day-long workshop on research methodology. In this session, sir will discuss with us on the topic policy research, po sorry, policy studies and research. I now humbly request Professor Biswajit Das, sir, to deliver his valuable lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Lopamudra, for your generosity to introduce me, but uh, I little feel ashamed. It is too long. Uh, you should try to sort it, make it short as possible. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, in fact, um, when I was asked, and thanks to Sanjeev for taking this initiative, in fact, I'm meeting after a long, long time, uh, although uh, through the uh, virtual meeting, and uh, it's indeed a great pleasure. Uh, being a sociologist, being a sociologist, I started my journey. And when I was sort of trying to do my research, uh, my first question, which was asked to me by my supervisor when I said that I'm interested in uh, communication studies and research. So one of my uh, teacher asked me, oh, you want to do an impact study? I think uh, within sociology, uh, studying policy probably is not much encouraged, uh, even though in, if you look at the beginning, uh, in fact, uh, the early 50s, you find that uh, anthropologists, sociologists immensely contributed to policies. So in fact, probably that aspect has been completely neglected within social sciences or even in uh, sociology and anthropology. In fact, entire your gamut of contributions which came out from Lucknow School of Sociology by D.N. Majumdar's studies are purely, I mean, policy-oriented studies. So I think one needs to think back and look at, but why is it that it is important to study policies? In fact, if you look at 50s, most of the village studies or the community studies, and subsequently when we launched with the idea of community development programs, that is where you find as a Ford Foundation supported uh, a major project to the Cornell University, which was subsequently launched in Saranpur in Devan. Um, it's a Ranakandi village where Sidhuve did a lot of contributions. Uh, that is where you find that there was a tremendous contribution in terms of studying policies and how policies, anthropologists and sociologists contributed to policy. But over the period of time, along with the first plan onwards, you find that there was a gradual disconnect between sociology and anthropology 
and the overall policy making in this country. And as a result, you find more and more policy communities evolved and more and more public administration as a discipline came up. And that is where sociology and anthropology took literally a backseat. So what we do subsequently in the later part of uh, 70s, 80s and 90s, we literally go and sort of try to study an impact of policies by looking at rural development, agricultural expansion, community development program, family planning program, and so on. So that we go to the village and sort of try to do a survey and trying to make assessment of the impact of policies uh, in the villages. So that's a story where we just confine to impact. So we sort of try to circulate questionnaire and sort of try to uh, collect the information and data and sort of try to say that, look, uh, policies are good, but it's, it's called blaming the victim concept so that policies are good, but the people are illiterate, fatalistic, and superstitious, and religious. That's why policies are not successfully being implemented. And so this is where almost literally there was a stalemate where we never enjoyed, virtually we completely delinked from studies. But if you look at the trajectory of the West, where you find that in sociology, what we teach sociology, is completely different. In the West, sociology is completely more and more policy-oriented discipline. It's a more a policy-oriented discipline. If at all we talk about anthropology in the West, probably they try to study what are the intentions behind this policy making. So this is where broadly we find that anthropology and sociology tremendously they contributed in making of policies. But if you look at the crisis today in the policy itself, we are completely caught off the way things are happening, the way the indexes are being shown, and this is where economists literally took over the social scientists and economics, if at all, would be considered anymore as a social science. So more and more technical, technical assessments and all kinds of things where there was a total delink uh, from sociology. And that is where we think that we need to now venture into policymaking as well. But where is the, where is the lack of fit? Now, one of the lack of fit where we see that that we social scientists and sociologists, we have gone in a big way into all micro studies. But today is the time that these micro studies are of no help at all. We need to, we need to overcome these micro studies. Even we need to engage in a larger context in the macro studies uh, also, not only confining to studying in a village and micro and sort of taking data, we also need to engage in a macro context, otherwise, our discipline is as at stake because what are we contributing? What are we contributing to an overall discourse or even let's say in the making of policy? So that's why otherwise we'll completely remain always in a back foot. So that is why it is also important to contribute and engage in a larger context in a, in, in a sense of engaging with a larger macro framework of policies. But now the question arises that our disciplines, our, our, our social sciences are more or less, they have sort of tried to maintain a distance from teaching policy. And they think that probably this is a too hard science, too hard science, and where we should not engage more, rather we should more be comfortable with studying culture and so on. So that is where policy always remain aloof. But if you look at last 20 years or so, you find that most of these management disciplines and engineering, and uh, institutions have come up in a big way into studying policies. Now, I mean, imagine that all the managements have taken over the social sciences, even though they basically borrowed our ideas, borrowed our ideas. And now management has become no more a kind of, an, uh, it has become a discipline now and sort of trying to engage more with the policies. So hence, I would say that it is important for being a sociologist also, it is important to engage with the studies on policy. So what I will do in my presentation is, basically, I will start with the basic conceptual issues about policies, conceptual issues about policies, and the idea of policy science, policy discipline, and how it is important that it takes from social science engagements. Then we will sort of try to go more deeper to analyze the documents, policy documents, analyze the policy documents. And finally, finally, I would sort of try to take up one of my students who will be 
also uh, there in the um, this particular uh, web meeting uh, she is also there and i have to, uh, and she has been currently working with me so she has done an interesting study using policy documents of 20 years and analyze what you call and show all of you must be knowing about the autonomy debates so we have sort of tried to look at media policy and where we have exclusively looked at uh, autonomy debates because you know that uh, ever since uh, emergency in 75 to 77 after that 77 onwards there was a lot of discussions and hiatus about we should make our media autonomous and ever since we have been going on engaging one after another committee reports are coming up but have we really achieved autonomy and that also finally we also look at the notions of what has happened to the issue of value so we are talking about public value what is the public value what constitutes public value when i look at television today i say that they lack values i mean whether it is a commercial or public broadcasting i would say that probably the distinctions would be that if we want to strengthen uh, the notion of more and more public engagement and that is what i would like to look at in terms of how much actually they are uh, proposing or sort of propagating the idea of public value so this is where uh, sort of my student has sort of done a lot of work interesting work in that sense of trying to analyze so that probably i would like to show you all the details and the way to collect information and sort of try to come up with some kind of summary so what metrics are there and how so that uh, i will sort of try to deal with it so before i go into that i will just sort of try to briefly make an introduction about saying that policy has become an increasingly uh, uh, i'm sorry i think uh, i'm supposed to add a ppt where do i how do i do it this is a share screen or what yeah yeah how share screen ka share screen na no? yeah okay yes sir so how do i show it i just bring it drag it here no 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 you can open that file from there only yeah ah, it's just come yes. yeah you come up yeah yeah i'm not bad uh, can you see it now yeah we can see it sir if you could enlarge it a bit <laughs> let me see <laughs> this is second stage yeah okay yeah 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 sir yeah. So now you can see that uh, policy has become an increasingly central concept and instrument in the organization of contemporary societies. Uh, like the modern, uh, like the modern state, policy uh, uh, policy now impinges on all areas of life, so that uh, it is virtually impossible uh, to ignore or escape its influence. it shapes the way individuals construe themselves as subjects through policy the individual is categorized and given such a status and roles such as subjects citizens professionals and uh, you know uh, what to call uh, national and then you say uh, even criminal and uh, you know deviant people are classified shaped and you know um, referred according to policies now when you read all these documents you see that how people have been looked at and different ways that they have been engaged with the stud the study of policy therefore leads straight um, into issues at the at the heart of what you call uh, norms and institutions ideology and consciousness knowledge and power rhetoric and discourse meaning and interpretation the global and the local i mean just to mention a few i mean the question arises how do policies work as instrument of governments and why do they sometimes fail to function uh, as intended what are the mobilizing metaphors and linguistic devices that cloak policy with the symbols and trappings of political legitimacy how do policies construct their subjects as objects of power and what new kinds of subjectivity 
or identity uh, uh, are being uh, created in the modern world? How are major shifts in the discourse uh, made authoritative? How are normative claims used to present a particular way of what you call uh, defining a problem and is what you call it and its solution? I mean, if we look at as in the recent times when we talk about the neoliberal discourse and practices have come to supplant what you call the post war model of welfare state, the way in which policies are used as an instrument of power for shaping individuals, or to use what Foucault's uh, terminology um, is, talks about political technology uh, of changing patterns of governance. By examining policy, we can shed light in changing styles and systems of governance and how these are reconfiguring the relationship between the individual and society. The question arises, what constitutes a policy? Is it found in the language, rhetoric, and concepts of political speeches and uh, what you call uh, um, um, party, uh, party uh, manifest manifestos? Is it uh, in the written documents produced by government or company officials? Is it embedded in the institutional mechanisms of decision making and service delivery? Or is it whenever people experience in their interactions with street level bureaucrats, a policy may differ enormously in these various manifestations. In fact, when you look at, I mean, if you look at the whole trajectory of policy making in India, as I just briefly, quickly mentioned about that, the Planning Commission, 1950s, the whole Nehruvian development program, and that is where Nehru sort of tried to invite all intellectuals across the world. And in, in spite of that, we did not succeed. Uh, one is about our food and inflation, population uh, explosion. So these uh, literally failed. And subsequently, more and more, the bureaucrats took over. And that is a term which is used categorically. It's called the policy communities. The policy communities. And this is where we realized that, look, it is, it is the um, execution part is weak. So where, you know, policies are implemented, how to execute policies. So more and more, we sort of try to come up with public administration and so on. And that is where the bureaucrats literally took over. And that's called policy community. And that policy community literally dominated the entire policy discourse, no matter policies are made outside. But literally, this is being endorsed by these policy communities till 80s and 90s, but 90s subsequently, you know that it changed drastically along with the liberalization you find. So we, we, we made a lot of shifts. So that's what we sort of try to study when we talk about policies. We say that we look at public good because we all know probably um, within our um, hindsight when we say about that, when I look at media, like any other, like electricity, water supply to my house, or even anything, I would say that, look, being a part of welfare state, these are actually public good. These are part, as a part of public good. I mean, the government has to make it ensure that it must come to my place, my house. So this is what a part of the public good. Now you find that we say that, look, these are like any other goods. These are also public goods. So the state must ensure these goods to your houses. But from 90s onwards, you find that that notion of welfare state has literally withdrawn. I'm sure in sociology, all of you are exposed to the larger studies on globalization and globalization. It's not about what globalization. It's about why, in what way that globalization is going to affect. So that is where you try to study the policies which are made the policies which reaches to the larger communities and how it is gradually affecting in everyday life. So this is a transformation in the policy itself. And that is where we sort of try to look at in terms of that how gradually state has literally withdrawn all the welfare mechanisms and gradually makes it to the market. So we call it the shift from media as a public good 
the media as a marketplace of ideas. Now you think about post 90s, your telecom is withdrawn, your Durdashan, you find that comes into a competition. So where more and more commercial players are coming up. So you find that it becomes a marketplace, a marketplace of ideas. So anybody can sell their ideas. So everybody's sort of trying to compete with each other. So the question is, it's like any other good. So the question arises, if media has to be sold like any other detergent in the market, the question is, can media thrive? Can media survive? And is it the function of media? Is it the function of media? Because when you link it with the larger questions of democracy, freedom of speech and so on, so that you need to also think about that, no, we need to think about the larger sense of public interest, because that is where we talk about that, how for a larger public interest that we need to revive a media, we need to make a just media, which must reflect, which must represent us, rather than media, which should completely be secluded from common man's dream. It should be a kind of an elitist project. Anyway, so these are larger issues I just quickly wanted to share. But the idea is that, look, policy has moved in that sense. Now, when we say that, look, policy, when you talk about that policy now, but the question is how it is being made. It's a question is that we are interested to know about the, it's not only about policy as a document, but what are, who are the actors? Who are the actors? So policy is used as an instrument. It is used as an instrument. Once you know that anything becomes a policy document, uh, then that becomes a sacrosanct document because you cannot change it. So it becomes a policy document. And for your information, there is no media policy in this country because there is no media policy in this country. In fact, we are governed by the larger uh, policies. And that is where that, uh, that also influences upon the way we sort of try to take a decision about media. It's not about media policy. We have an exclusive media policy. We don't have any media policy per se. So we are basically governed by the larger policy of the state. And that also inflicts upon the way the media has to be viewed and understood. So we sort of try to understand media. So in that sense, I would say that an instrumentalist view of government conceptualizes policy as a tool to regulate a population, regulate a population from the top down uh, through what you call uh, rewards and sanctions. I mean, according to this uh, uh, conception, policy is as what you call intrinsically <coughs> sorry, technical, rational, action-oriented, I mean, um, in, instrument uh, that decision makers use to solve problems and affect change. Policy denotes the principles that govern action directed towards uh, what you call given ends. Policy has a more diffuse impact when through metaphors of the individual and society. It influences the way people construct themselves, their conduct and their social relations um, on uh, you know, what you call free individuals. It reminds me uh, that I was saying that why it is important to study. Um, sometimes you study uh, election speeches, election speeches and sort of try to study how the leaders speak and the rhetorics. I mean, it's also very important to sometimes study that what has happened to rhetorics. I mean, I, my, my earlier study where I sort of tried to study on rhetorics, like uh, during elections, the manifestos and the public speakers, when they speak and you sort of try to collect all the speeches and sort of try to analyze those speeches and you will find a gem of material in terms of understanding how the rhetorics contribute to and are they really following. In fact, there is a link between what they speak in election and what the office, the way the office functions, there is a disconnect. But however, uh, scholars also try to study through the rhetorics. I mean, there are different categorizations of rhetorics. In fact, if you ask me, my study says that uh, uh, an Arabian priest with destiny the kind of rhetorics which were made and subsequently 70s 80s onwards you find there is a 
different way of engagement with rhetorics. I mean, I, I remember that when Nehru uh, came up in 50s and, and completely enchanted, made people public spellbound in terms of the Victorian English and the way he spoke about, you know, about policies and international issues, how many people really enjoyed, understood what he spoke? I don't think very much people are really they enjoyed. Uh, they were just, I mean, it's a kind of, you are completely, it's an enigmatic character and sort of everybody's spellbound. He makes everybody, you know, completely psyched in terms of his speeches and actions and writing. Hardly how many people. So that is a kind of a democracy which was exclusionary. Uh, hardly people, I mean, look at the people's participation in 50s and 60s. People never understood, but 70s, 80s, the moment more your caste issue, your community issue, your religious issue, you find there is a massive jump in terms of people's participation. There are interesting studies like when Lalu's rhetorics are, I mean, there are studies which shows that how Lalu's rhetorics really made people more and more. So in that sense, our democracy, it's very interesting that in what direction your democracies are moving. It's not that you say it's a decline or the health of democracy is being affected. Rather, probably democracy, India is the largest democracy. Probably India's democracy is more and more now getting grounded, getting grounded where it should have been initially because democracy is, a, is an alien construction. It is an alien concept. Now, when we talk about democracy, it's not about British democracy. In fact, there are different there are democracies within democracy we need to understand there are democracies within democracy because there is no single model of democracy today in the world in fact even that democracy is also failing <laughs> i mean so if the question arises there are different formats of democracies now pakistan also talks about they are a democratic country india also says we are a democratic country and britain also says that we are a democratic country so you need to understand the kind of democracy and the kind of rhetorics which are being played in the everyday. Uh, so that is the context to understand that what democracies are, rather than making a universalizing categories of democracy and sort of trying to engage with the notion of democracy. Anyway, so I, I just wanted to say that, look, um, um, uh, by problematizing policy, we uh, aim to chart a new territory for social sciences. Pioneering analysis of uh, complex power systems have been carried out effectively through studies uh, um, uh, of policies. Uh, they have not been labeled, uh, but not have been labeled as such. We propose that uh, a focus on policy provides a new way of formulating uh, these issues, which is essential if scholars are to understand those shifting political and cultural orders, uh, um, and what Apadurai calls it, in fact, a global ethnoscape, in fact. Uh, policies are inherently and univocally, uh, they are sociological and anthropological phenomena. They can be read by anthropologists in a number of ways as cultural text, as classificatory devices, um, you know, with various mean as narratives uh, that uh, serve to justify or condemn the present or as theoretical devices and discursive formations uh, that function to empower um, uh, uh, some people and silence others. Not only to uh, 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 not only policies codify social norms and values um, um, and uh, you know uh, articulate fundamental uh, organizing the principles of society. They also contain implicit and sometimes explicit models of, uh, you know, uh, society. Um, uh, I mean, policy serves uh, as a, what do you call a mechanism for uh, dis uh, what do you call disguising the identity of decision makers, hence defining a course of action as official policy of the government or organization serves to make decision making uh, more uh, generalized and more impersonal. 
and bureaucratic and anonymous, like bureaucracy, of which it is a major political accessory, policy can serve uh, to cloak subjective, ideological, um, uh, and uh, what you call, uh, um, uh, and arguably, um, you know, um, what you call highly uh, irrational goals to the guise of uh, national, collective, uh, universalized objectives. Policies also have a legitima legitimizing function. Uh, uh, you know, uh, not only uh, do they, uh, what you they call, outline the course of action to be taken, um, uh, they also serve to fix uh, the course within the framework of a wider and more universal set of goals and uh, what you call uh, principles. Uh, you know, th this is where the principles uh, um, now coming more specifically now to what you call the policy documents. Uh, what you, it's very important uh, to understand. Um, Documents, why we study documents. Um, what do you call now documents? As I said, documents, uh, you know, um, like compared to other sources such as uh, interviews um, or survey data, documents are uh, what do you call right uh, there and uh, accessing them, um, um, you know, often. Um, causes nothing. I mean, uh, costs nothing. In fact, I mean, when you are talking about documents are already there, and uh, nothing. So different research questions imply different criteria of relevant documents. Not all uh, relevant documents are readily available. Those that are, uh, you know, uh, can give a partial or even you know uh, misleading uh, picture of policy making. And much of what goes on in the policymaking process does not even have a, a paper trail to be analyzed. There are different conceptions in social sciences concerning what a document uh, is. In fact, you know, John Scott, uh, when we talk about John Scott, defines a document as an art, what you call artifact, uh, which has, I mean, he um, uh, talks about uh, it is an artifact. Uh, which has, uh, I mean, at its uh, central feature an inscribed text, others inclined to think of uh, text as uh, what you call media, um, uh, more broadly into uh, include audiovisual sources in their definition of documents. Documents are often explicitly distinguished from research literature as records produced or generated without a researcher's intervention. Documents can also be categorized um, according to uh, whether they are um, made systematically or accidentally, whether they are uh, what you call uh, intended for a public readership and whether they being uh, to the realm of research or not. In fact, so this is where uh, you can uh, understand documents uh, as we said about um, so this is where you can see that uh, um, I mean using document implies some form of textual analysis there are a number of important advantages of using documents as we talked about compared to uh, Compared to, um, um, sorry, what is it? I mean, there are so many advantages compared to most other. Um, <coughs> sorry. See, compared to most other uh, sources, Documents are stable. They can be stored, retrieved, and copied. Many documents are even easily available, and they give researchers first and access to policy processes and stakeholders' positions. If the alternative is either asking people 
involved or observing the actual processes, documents seem more realistic to use. And sometimes, for instance, when dealing with historical census, the only means documents are therefore an efficient and cost effective data source. I mean, important challenges with using documents, we can talk about that these are often considered distinct from academic literature and other documentary like secondary sources, like we talk about interpretation as primary sources uh, that represent objective statements or facts written by active uh, participants in the policy process. Documents are understood as more reliable sources of factual information about policy processes. I mean, all policy and industry documents, no matter how dry and neutral, uh, they frame issues in a certain light and only present one possible construction of reality and one perspective into the issue and possible solutions. Although official documents are often read as objective, uh, what you call uh, uh, statements of facts, they're always socially produced. As a fundamental level, documents raise the issue of authenticity. Documents can be falsified or tampered with. They, I mean, uh, with they can include missions, omissions, and distortions, and they might be more or less typical of their kind. A document is a social phenomenon in the sense that it was uh, created under a set of circumstances for a specific purpose by specific people at a certain time and place. We need to question both the authenticity uh, and the credibility of each source. We also need to consider how representative a source is or alternately clarifying how it is typical. I mean, researchers need to document the process of selecting the data, maintain a critical relation to the sources and the transparent regarding and be transparent regarding their normative premises uh, 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 and own possible stake in the policy process. Source criticism and self-reflection are not isolated steps in the research process, but constant considerations. Documents can help, can also be um, hard to contextualize and interpret. To more fundamentally, they can be written to address different audiences and to serve different purposes with consequences for their argumentative style, the use of references, and substantiation of claims like i mean uh, the, this creates challenges when piecing together a what you call a comprehensive picture of the policy process and in particular when making uh, comparisons a final pitfall i mean associated with documents is that they do not consider cover alternative and policy options uh, never considered in its first place i mean as one of the leading scholar Des Friedman uh, has noted that media policy research usually focus on the public exercise of official power, visible and overt decision making actions like government intervention, regulatory activity, civil society engagement and corporate initiatives. Re relaying, relying on official documents or letting these documents guide the premises and parameters of the research. Uh, this involves the danger of neglecting more radical alternatives or less visible um, arenas and modes of decision making and power. According to Friedman, to take into account the processes of policy silences and non-decision making, policy researchers need to examine also the means by which alternative options are marginalized, conflicting values are delegitimized, and rival interests de-recognized. I mean, these are the three important things what Des Friedman uh, refers to. In fact, re reasons to complement 
and compare official documents with other sources such as uh, rival accounts produced by civil society organization and activists, academic debates, media coverage of other sources that clarify uh, what, the, what you call the broader historical and political context, identification and accessing the most relevant documents depends entirely on the aims of the study. In a study that compares legislation in different countries, it may be sufficient to simply collect the relevant legal texts and possible translations to uncover the policy formulation process and the power of different influences on the other hand needs to seek access to public consultations and position papers uh, and perhaps also lobbying rec uh, records of other correspondence between stakeholder and policymakers a study that focuses on the framing and discourses around policy issues it may be reasonable to concentrate on other types of texts such as speeches media coverage parliamentary debates or press releases in addition it is often useful to complement documents with interviews with policymakers or stakeholders surveys participant observation or other methods depending on the research questions now we, we here distinguish three main phases involved in using policy and industry documents in media policy research one we talk about the research design and identification of potentially relevant document types and sources then accessing collecting and sampling of the documents then conducting the analysis for a more detailed description of the research process so these are the steps to be followed as i said about the one would be the research design and the identification of relevant documents access collections and so on so this is where we sort of trying to look at the idea of as i mentioned to you about values i said about public value that why it is important to revive values public values in our public service broadcasting to strengthen uh, public service broadcasting in fact one of my students who's sort of trying to work on um, public value in public service broadcasting that's an interesting area um, she's sort of trying to do on in a way that saying that probably we need to revive public service broadcasting with a sense of a public value which is most important rather than completely making ourselves syllable to the larger uh, commercial claims and you know commercial channels so this is where we we need to strengthen our public service broadcasting but it should have a strong public value in fact if you look at some of these scandinavian countries uh, they have done remarkably well where you find that television they call it a public service television and that has a very strong sense of public values now the question is here how to measure how to map that value so that is very important and we sort of try to do in our small exercise which i would like to share it with you uh, so this is where we sort of trying to do that how looking documents from a value tip. Now, what are the overall reactions of scholars? What do they talk about? They say that public and policy documents are the final products of extensive deliberations resulting through a consensus over a set of values. So I'm saying that why consensus? Or why are we talking about consensus? I think uh, since uh, we are talking about public policy, we also need to understand that we moved, started with the idea of anthropology and sociology in understanding policy now more and more we move towards a parliamentary democracy where there are deliberations and there is always a kind of a consensus building exercise so this is what we say that a pluralistic way of engaging with policy making where you know parliament is a sort of a space where people across um, oppositions they come together they sort of try to you know uh, brainstorm and sort of try to come out with a consensus. However, um, not that that is final. I mean, I would not say that uh, in a majoritarian society, how much minority voices are being uh, heard. I mean, minorities here does not mean a religious minority. Even a, you know, women, for instance, their voices are they heard in larger discourse. So the question is, the voices with the marginal. I think the marginal would be a better way to engage. Is that how marginals are further marginalized 
in that context. So, you know, so the question is, so the, if, if the voices are marginalized, where is the space for consensus? It's already dictated. Now, if you look at uh, over these last couple of months, uh, the way decisions, the way things are happening, so we find that that's why parliament needs a striking balance, striking balance to have a consensus. So that's what we say that consensus will be possible when people leave aside their vested interest to think rationally. This is what John Rawls and Habermas, they talk about. Difference in interest arises due to incommensurable values and social consensus is indeed an utopian idea. However, one strives to achieve that. This is Stanfeld Mufe talks about. Or even conflicting values provide positive grounds to people to negotiate, accept common set of values. I mean, although a value consensus can never be obtained, however, it is important to know whether the value trade-off happened at the time of document preparation, which values are hoisted by policymakers while preparing the documents, and are those values serving the purpose of objectives of the policy intent? You know, these are larger questions. So this is where we're sort of trying to <coughs> do a kind of a um, value um, matrix. We sort of try to prepare a larger matrix. We call it uh, public value mapping models, or public values, uh, you know, scorecards or public value tests. One can analytically search for public values in government documents, scholarly literature, cultural artifacts. In fact, why we have uh, done it here, looking at the public document, I say that uh, I remember a couple of years ago, um, I mean, it basically looks at the three questions, whether the values which the committee reports have endorsed in their recommendations, suggestions, and findings are in favor of autonomous public broadcasting or not. And secondly, to highlight if there are transition and continuity of values in the debates stretched over the span of almost six decades. Then C, to draw some inferences from the data at hand, followed by discussions. So this is where you find that the time frame for this particular study, which has been taken from 1964 to 2014. I mean, it's quite a long um, period. and. Uh, my student has painfully gone through all these uh, reports and sort of tried to prepare a kind of a matrix and sort of trying to look at that what values they're referring to, like 64 to 2014. Um, so I can show you the data before that we come to the conclusion. So now you can see the matrix here. I think um, if you can make it enlarged, uh, you can see that each, uh, each in fact, uh, I don't know how to go about it. So here, how to make it? I mean, here it's been all mapped <coughs> report-wise. It's very interesting. I mean, why have we sort of tried to follow this original documents to analyze the reports? A student of mine came to me and sort of trying to do work on autonomy and asked, Sir, uh, guide me something about autonomy uh, I would like to look at. Then I said, but uh, look at all these scholars who have written on autonomy. Because we, we train our students to do a policy analysis. Then he showed me, he said, sir, most of the authors, most of the authors have quoted the same passage from the original policy document. It was quite shocking. I mean, I, so the authors, there is no variations. I mean, the same book has been, the passage in the book has been quoted by all. So the, it is com completely pointless. It is completely pointless. So because it, nobody has taken seriously such kind of work. So hence you find this is a very original in that sense, the work where these are documents which are read and on the basis of reading these documents, you find that uh, sort of trying to collect all the information and different values which are mapped. And finally, um, these are appendix, but then on the basis of mapping these values, then we have sort of tried to come at uh, these conclusions, I call it in lieu of conclusion, that 
creative values are creative freedom uh, values and creative freedom are not given much importance or weightage in the debates i mean you look at all the 64 to 2014 hardly there is any discussions about freedom or importance given importance in the debates all the values discussed may not fit well to the future public which came alongside the convergence of technology and market network when completely misplaced if you look at the series of developments in india and suddenly the convergence bill comes and public service autonomy everything has been completely sidelined so i'm saying that uh, you know uh, so the discussions values is different than what you see the convergence in technologies somewhere we missed we have never been able to problematize or even raise the idea that how to strengthen our broadcasting the values discussed still uphold public as a state or government bodies in fact it is not very clear that what we mean by public in fact my student is doing an excellent work on public so the question is what we mean by public in fact as i discussed earlier that broadcasting is a public good now suddenly in 90s onwards you find that uh, literally the government has lost its grip and control over broadcasting now because we are forced to open the broadcasting to the larger world so this is where global players have come up so it is no more the nation state has a monopoly of jurisdiction to control the broadcasting now anybody from any part of the world can sort of try to be in sort of try to come india has to open up india is a part of that uh, trade off so india has to open up that economy so broadcasting comes up so now the question is so your jurisdictions are no more in the nation state these are now transnational boundaries so broadcasting you can't you sue anybody here you have to go to washington like star tv you have to sue you have to go there even a small like uh, you do erp rating tan even i remember that nam at uh, star tv had to go to washington to norway had to sue a case against tan so i'm saying now you can imagine that the context is different this is actually a transnational the national boundaries have collapsed in that sense more and more flow of institutions are coming up to india so now you need to think about that issues are different so in that sense when you talk about we still remain that's why there is a saying that when our technology becomes digital our politics becomes extremely analogic so we have not shifted away in our thinking we still think state will do this state will do that why the hell state will do state will not do anything we live in a neoliberal time but the way the public is used and abused that is what you need to look at the policies if you look today that even the broadcast bill of 2005 6 where television they were sort of trying to make the broadcast bill we have not yet come out even in 2020 the bill has not yet been settled because now it's very difficult for the government to make a bill without the stakeholders consent now all the stakeholders are equally competing their claims in making and managing policies so that is where you need to understand that it is not an easy game but it's an interesting game it's an interesting game and how a sociologist benefits by doing such studies because we have a strength we have a strength of studying institutions we have a study we have a strength of studying institutions and instruments so these are most important things when we say that as a social science and sociology in particular we have a strength of studying these institutions and instruments and we contribute immensely by understanding whether it is a corruption whether it is anything for that matter so today you find that more and more think tank organizations are coming up all small small think tank organizations are coming up they are always lobbying and competing claims to the government so you find that the more the new liberal agenda more such rise of think tank bodies and think tank organizations so sociology the idea and knowledge of sociology can also move to different directions to you know channelize and also contribute more creatively and that is the purpose i thought that i would like to share it thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you very much
uh, I remember those golden days when I I got I was lucky enough to listen to you. It was looking that it is coming from an expertise, you know, person who has worked a lot on policy issues and research. And I hope that all our participants must have been, you know, thoroughly benefited. Uh, before I ask a few questions raised by some of the participants, I'll request Dr. A.M. Saklani ji, Deputy Director, IGNO Regional Center, Noida, to please uh, say a few words, comments, observations on Professor Biswajit sir. Yeah, Dr. A.M. Saklani sir. Before Saklani sir says anything, Saklani sir, I'm in your campus. I'm in your campus. We have campus में बैठा हूँ। In ignore sir? हाँ हाँ हाँ। That's nice to learn. <laughs> That's nice one. I must say I was mesmerized by the lecture, sir. You have in fact uh, dealt uh, the way with quotings from the making and un unmaking of the media policy and given us the attributes of policy, policy making, policy documents. And the real challenge for a researcher, how to interpret an approach and wherein the questions of credibility, authenticity, they take place. I, with this, I pose a small question, sir. Right. In contemporary India, in independent India, the important policy documents such as white papers, which have been issued by the governments, whether it was during the confrontation with China or after Operation Blue Star, they came up as important documents and uh, the public believes what... Uh, as you said, the enigmatic personality of Nehru and other leaders were in uh, great regard for the leaders and whatever was being told to the nation by the leaders were important. How do we approach and interpret documents, semantic documents such as these and what should be our, uh, you know, as researchers uh, drawing a fine line or reading between the lines? How would you comment on this? You see, uh, you know that Saklani sahab, uh, more and more now we will be exposed to such kind of white papers. In fact, uh, like white paper is very common in fact in broadcasting. If you look at uh, BBC, uh, Ofcom uh, brings out series every year, white papers, every year white papers. So these are issues, position paper, white paper, policy paper. You know, in lieu of a policy, you will find a lot of white papers will come up. So now we should be more and more trained. Now, how to look at policy? Policy, as you rightly pointed out about reading between the lines. So the question is now for a, 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 as a social scientist, as a social scientist, as a media theorist, we have been skilled enough to handle these kind of texts. Now these kind can be understood in either you are using textual analysis or deconstruction, discourse analysis, the kind of reading documents and there is a technique of reading and our deciphering meanings from these texts. So we are now skilled enough. So I gave you an idea about document analysis. The document can be anything. The white paper is a document. Now how that documents are to be read, how the documents are to be read. So I give you from 64 to 2014, uh, my student has done a laborious work, sort of trying to put them all together, trying to read regarding values how these documents have highlighted the issue of values or even the idea of public or the idea of autonomy, what actually the discussions and debates are autonomy or even the texts are just written for no reasons. I mean, I, I remember, I'll tell you very interestingly, hmm. yeah. I was looking at uh, recently, I was reading on uh, most of the um, journalism literature, like uh, I mean, I, I, I basically, like which is being taught in undergrad level. Journalism literature, which is introduced at the undergrad level, like across the country. So why it is important, why it is important. I basically wanted to study what is actually in circulation in these texts. And that legitimized the student's mind for years, for generations, because there is not much variations in the text. We do not find the one is feeling very happy that look, that same text has fifth edition has come out selling very well. But is in social sciences for understanding writing a textbook is extremely difficult, uh, you know, a challenging in a sense. Now, when I look back, 
I was showing that somebody came, somebody, a friend of mine who came and who wrote a book, a very interesting book, or it's called India's First Newspaper. Uh, it's actually a book on James Augustus Hickey, who actually came uh, to Calcutta, uh, failed thoroughly in England, and an Irish man, and landed up in Calcutta, and uh, he uh, sort of tried to start a printing machine. And then he was printing uh, um, what you call registers for the British regiment. Then when the regiments uh, um, did not pay him uh, money, which he did the work, he was very annoyed and started writing all against them. Or oh, they were their private life and this. This is called Hickey's paper. That's the first newspaper which came out. Now, when I uh, showed him these texts, the first report of our first press commission report, and I showed him, he just laughed. He just laughed and he said, there are so many mistakes in these lines. There are so many mistakes in these lines. Imagine people for decades have read these texts. Has it not corrupted? Has it not corrupted generations of people, those who are in the discipline? So the question is, unless one questions, so when he read it, he said that, look, these are absolutely nonsense. But when I read it, I find that I read it as an ext extremely an interesting literary text, or what you call a literary piece of journalism. That can't be journalism per se, which is being taught or practiced. So the question is, these kind of engagements are missing in Indian context to engage with media scholarship. So this is where we bring our social science ideas or humanities or bring to journalism or communication and address these issues. So that is what we are doing. So now obviously in the future coming years, you find that more and more, uh, in fact, policy analysis, policy study, it has not yet uh, picked up within the communications. But you know, like economists are probably really high at the moment. So you find all the think tank organizations are basically dominated by economists. So you talk about Ikriar, you talk about all such ORF, or you talk about all policy think tank bodies. It is they who control it because they play with the number, number crunching games. That's what they play. It. But you do not uh, see much exciting because more and more it's the time that, that our social science should take over, should come up. We are disenchanted with the economists, the way they're making policies. It has utterly failed in this country. In fact, look at this BSE, Sensex Index. They have literally made nothing, no meaning at all. I think the coming two and a half months has taught us a lot because <laughs> economics have literally failed in this country. So this is what we need to rethink. And social science has tremendous promise in terms of contributions to policy making. I think we need to revive, we need to teach, we need to more and more because our social science is completely abrupt of any readings of the policies. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Anjana, sir. Ma'am would like to say something. Again, again, uh, the Assistant Director Igno Regional Center, Noida, sir. As a strange. As a uh, yeah, Dr. Anjana. Yeah. Uh, very good evening to you, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, sir, in front of your vast knowledge and experience, I do not find myself competent enough to comment upon your lecture or ask you something. The way no, you no, have no, explained no. the things and you have enlightened us, what I can do is that I just wish to express my gratefulness to you that, that you have spared your valuable time uh, for this workshop and being present with her uh, with us sir thank you very much sir really grateful to you sir thank you thank you very much sir there, there are two questions uh, rather one compliment and one question which has come up in the question answer section first i read the compliment for you namaskar sir thank you very much for informative valuable analytical reviews and deliberations on policy study and issues uh, this is from sujata rani rai associate professor darjeeling government college Wonderful. and yeah, the, the question which has come up from Deepa SV, Assistant Professor, Department of Sociology, Government First Grade College from Chikabulpur, Karnataka, sir. Evaluate, okay. yeah, 
evaluative research on uh, policies is suggested or not as we need to visit various government sources this question i am putting across right now because i am pursuing phd on women construction workers you see <clears throat> see evaluation is one part of it policy is not not all about evaluations policy implementation is being evaluated now when the policy program is being Im implemented then you are sort of trying to so evaluation does not have much charm you know it's just like you are evaluating a project and phd is not a project you need to think about it because most of the phds which is coming up in the countryside in various provincial universities they do not have much to offer simply because it's just like an evaluation of a program and evaluation of a project or a program cannot be a phd I mean, that's why you need to think seriously about when you formulate your proposal and the way you ask questions, because asking the art of asking question is very important. How to formulate a question? Because the way you formulate a question, that itself decides the entire horizon of your work. As simply, I sort of try to start. I know uh, most of the people, they, the day you register PhD, then you immediately say, tell a question, run a question, or run a question. Then immediately you start, you start the other way around because you do not know the possibilities. You do not know about the potential of the larger issue, the gamut of things. And suddenly you sort of trying to evaluate. So evaluation is one part of the story. I mean, you see, you don't make your thesis, demean your thesis to mere evaluation. I would request but don't demean your thesis to an evaluation. Thesis is much broader. Thesis is much broader. Broaden your horizon so that at least it will sustain you for coming 30, 40 years in the profession. Otherwise, you lose your steam. In five years, you have nothing to do. You'll be moving from one evaluation to another evaluation. See, so these evaluations have no meaning at all. I again suggest you think about it, think seriously, and broaden your phd horizon the moment you get into evaluation you are a more a technical person you know you are evaluating projects so phd is not a project it is a program okay yeah thank you very much sir before i request dr lopamudra to deliver the vote of thanks i'll request any of other panelists some of my colleagues are there in the panel section uh, dr rk sharma sir dr sanjay if any of my uh, colleague wants to say something. Uh, yes, R.K. Sharma, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, very informative and valuable for me and I think all the participants uh, about the information about the study of policy documents. And uh, you have also uh, uh, given us the steps to be followed in the study of policy documents. And these policies are social phenomena phenomenon and they should be studied and they have the message and we can compare the policies and we can compare the actual doc documents available in the society with policies. This has, uh, this has been very enlightening and uh, I think that uh, some of the policies uh, made by the government for uh, development uh, in the rural society uh, uh, have been studied to some extent. Uh, I think uh, um, this uh, policy of reservation for... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Panchayat has been a focus of study. And PRI study. Panchayat Raj Institute. Yeah. In spite of uh, so many years, uh, women in rural areas are uh, are still not empowered. And yes. uh, I think they themselves are not ready to come forward and take the uh, powers uh, given by the government. They feel, I, I think they feel it convenient to uh, stay behind their husbands and other male members uh, in the <laughs> A family and it is more convenient uh, instead of taking uh, your own decision you just uh, pass it on to someone else so uh, a long time has passed and we were thinking that with education and with new generation coming uh, but that has not happened so uh, i think this policy uh, reservation policy also is a subject of study that whether uh, we can give something as product reservation can be given as product or, uh, or how to transfer uh, the idea behind the reservation for women. 
and how to uh, encourage them or motivate them that you come forward and uh, take these powers and uh, uh, take your own decision for the development of this society. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I think, uh, Professor Sarma, you have a very uh, wonderful uh, suggestion. Uh, I have an experience of doing PRI uh, uh, research, uh, one in Ladakh, uh, I've done in Ladakh Lay District, uh, I've done in Kargil and Lay. I did a PRI study, and also in Pesa areas, where tribal areas, you know, we call it Pesa. So you have a PRI in uh, plains and Pesa in the areas. <clears throat> It's uh, not a question of women are not coming forward. The question is, uh, you, you must have recently seen in UP, probably in one of the villages where uh, the women uh, leader, but her husband and family members, they literally killed uh, the people. So the question is, in a larger, the government has a wishful thinking to you know, uh, dedicate certain constituencies as the women's constituency. Uh, but um, um, ultimately, you know, that larger patriarchy which operates in our society and controls, so that we are sort of trying to, I, I know that for last uh, several decades, that how, uh, you know, uh, males getting married to young women and sort of trying to make them uh, contest elections and a uh, lot of things are happening. So we immediately find out different ways and means to uh, corrupt the entire system. So the question is, there are larger issues and questions rather than what in the surface we look at. What we see apparently in sometimes seeing is not believing. <laughs> sometimes, you know, what you see also you shut your eyes. So, but anyway, nice to see you, Samaji. So, uh, your discipline is sociology? Uh, yes, sir. Sir, sir, I, I am associate professor in Sanjeev's department of sociology, sir. No, wonderful. 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 Uh, thank you very much, sir. Now I request Dr. Lopa Mudra to please deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Professor Vishwajit Das, sir for such an elaborate and insightful discussion on the topic, policy studies and research. We have learned today, conceptual ideas of policies and policy issues, understanding documents and how to analyze, analyze the policy documents, importance of documents in the policy making, how does the policy works and also gave us uh, the idea about uh, policy issues, how the policy research is conducted, uh, conducted step by step uh, and many more are the takeaways from today's enriching session. On behalf of Indira Gandhi National Open, Inst uh, Open University Regional Center, NOIDA, NAS College, Mirat, Dr. Sanjeev Mahajan, sir, head of the uh, head of sociology department, NAS College, and convener of this seven day long workshop on research methodology, and all the participants, I extend my sincere gratitude to Professor Viswajit Das, sir, for sharing his time with us despite having a busy schedule and enlightening us on the given topic. On behalf of the management, I would like to thank all the participants of this session who are attending from different parts of the room, but not the list. I would like to thank Dr. Sanjeev Mahajan, sir, for arranging this seven day long workshop and giving us the opportunity to enhance our knowledge with the wisdom of the experts from different fields. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's my pleasure meeting so many people. In fact, that's a huge number. Thanks to Sanji. And thanks to Lupamudra for introducing you with your sense of generosity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. It was an honor to have you with me. And I hope that this patronage will continue. And, you know, I straight away give you a phone call whenever I require any help from you. And you're <laughs> no. kind enough that you always, you know, keep my promises up I, and I hope that the same will continue in near future too, sir. Saklani sahab se baat karo. Saklani sir, yeah, yeah. Sir. Saklani sahab, wo haak jhaat tha na, gulab. Ji, ji, ji. He superannuated last year, sir. Haan, uh, gulab jhaab. Superannuated last year. Wo mera senior tha. Jenu, sir. Haan. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll, I'll convey to him, sir. Haan, <laughs> haan, please, please convey. 
please convey my regards to him he is my senior and uh, nice to hear sir uh, nice of, to hear मैं आपकी कैंपस में ही रहता हूँ सर हाँ सर मैं ये चाह रहा हूँ कि आप मैम का कनेक्शन बताएं क्योंकि सर <laughs> सर सर बहुत सोच रहे हैं कि भाई हाउ विश्वजीत दास सर जेन यू सॉरी फ्रॉम जामिया मिलिया इज स्टेइंग इन द कैंपस ऑफ इंदिरा गांधी नेशनल ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी मैम इज इन डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशियोलॉजी इंदिरा गांधी नेशनल ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी Yeah, uh, he knows everything. So. <laughs> Very nice, sir. Eighty-nine. So, He's from here in eight since eighty-nine. Sir, आपका जब वहाँ था सबदर्जन में. जी जी. सबदर्जन डेवलपमेंट एरिया में. वहाँ से तब से. जी सर. Okay, sir. Yeah, thanks, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. It was pleasure, sir. It was pleasure. Thank you, sir.